It's all about the image. It's all about the image. Oh boy, I have a press conference. We've got to be in charge because after all, we are da -da -da -da, the FBI, right? So the locals hate them because they always big deal everything and take over and say, this is now our case. Now, yeah, now that we solved it for you, you federal bastard, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so yeah, so we had, we had uh, sayings for that and one was, we call them the fan belt inspectors. They didn't like that. You know? uh, fruit and berry inspectors was another one that was popular. And then I had a kid come in my office one day with an older agent who I knew. The older guy was a pretty good guy. His name is Charlie Sullivan. He'd been in the FBI a long time. And he and I worked together a lot, and he's a good fellow. But he's got this kid with him, you know, right out of college with a shiny new gun, you know, and uh, he, wa he walks in, oh yeah, college, boy. just like I was. You know. He walks in and he uh, arrogantly announces that he's Special Agent Norris. I said, is that right? Well, what's so special about you? <laughs> <laughs> and he just heard beat red, you know. Sullivan says, now, Kenda, be nice. <laughs> or they'd walk in and I'd say, and what can I do for the representatives of the Crown today? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like that either, you know. So, there was a natural rivalry that went on. Some of it was pretty serious, depending upon who you dealt with. I had an occasion when Louis Free was the director, the little short guy that did the Penn State thing. He was really a jerk. And uh, one of his, uh, the SAC in charge for the Western region of the United States, the FBI, he, uh, he was Eric Dehone, was the guy's name. I took Kathy, he was now walking out of here at the moment, but I took her <laughs> to Eric's house for a political dinner. We had to go, we had to go to his house. He had an I Love Me wall that would, it's, it's incredible, you know what I mean? Here's Eric with the Pope, Eric on the moon, you know, all these pictures of him. All the presidents, you know, okay, whatever, Eric, you know. And so, we went to this meeting, uh, a law enforcement meeting, and he was there, and uh, I told a joke about the FBI that was rather crude. I got back to, it was in Denver, the meeting, so I get back to my office. The chief calls me, he says, Come over here. Uh-oh. You know, so I go, <coughs> what? He said, did you know the FBI has humor police? <laughs> I said, what? He said, Eric Dehon was personally promoted by Louis Free. Personally. He likes this kid, apparently. The joke was on Eric that I told, okay? The director of the FBI, Louis Free, calls my chief of police and demands that I am I get disciplined for telling this joke. And I looked at this uh, at the chief, and she's got a smirk on his face. I said, you didn't think that the director of the FBI would have better shit to do, wouldn't you? He says, no kidding, get out of here. He said, that, he said that's a great joke, by the way. I said, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, so that's why, I mean, we're not exactly friends. You know, but yes, sir. Hey, uh, LT, uh, again, thanks for coming out. I had a question about the, the issue, uh, the incident with the grenade. Mm -hmm. Were you able to uh, get with CID and ever trace down where that grenade came from? And yeah, we did, but the problem with weaponry, particularly explosives, is that they don't maintain a buy, buy item inventory. It's quantity inventory. We know what, what crate it was in, you know, what unit it went to, they didn't know. They just had X number of grenades, you know. It's, we had an M16 machine gun one time. We took off a guy, and we couldn't trace that because the, the manufacturer sold it to the United States Army. The guy confessed, okay, as to where he got it out of his unit. So I called this major, <laughs> Army major, and I said, hey, major, you know, you missing an M60 from your army? Absolutely not. We have a close inventory. I said, major, major, go look again. <laughs> because if you... If you keep up with this, I'm going to end your military career tonight. <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, we have one that's missing. Well, I have it. So, send somebody down there, I give it back. Okay, along with 8,000 rounds of 7.62, because he had that too. Who knows what he's going to do with that? Wow. Of course, yeah. But to buy item stuff, they, it's very difficult on, on ordnance. They, they kind of say the pile is as big today as it was yesterday, and they don't pay attention to it. And their record keeping is pretty bad when it comes to those items, personal, you know, like like hand grenades, like uh, uh, you know claymores. They don't write it down. They just say we gave them to the unit. They they got this many grenades. Yeah. Okay.
whatever. It's kind of a dead end. CID is very competent, very good people. But he said, we're at the limit of what our records will indicate. And we don't have records for that. Okay. They have stuff there from World War II, of course, and ammo bunkers. They're still shooting 50 cal they made in World War II. Redstone arms, you know. But it's still there in cans. Nothing wrong with it. But yeah, they couldn't turn it. They couldn't. They tried. <laughs> they said we we can get to the battalion. That's as far as we can go. <laughs> well, that's not going to work, you know. So yeah, we need to get it to the dude, you know. But it didn't happen. Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> we're actually about 12 minutes over our allotted time for this session. But uh, what we're going to do now, as the comedians like to say, he's here all week, folks. And so uh, <laughs> what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to take another quick break. And then we're going to bring up uh, cast members led by Carl Marino and other cast members who've appeared on uh, the Homicide Hunter, our favorite TV show. So uh, let's give Lieutenant Joe a huge round of applause. sees Diane Daly walk in, tell her she's got to take her seat over here, please. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, the first person actually appeared in, remember the Memorial Day Marathon commercial? Uh, this is, uh, this lady uh, appeared in that and uh, also has been involved in many different uh, TV shows for Homicide, I'm sorry, for Investigation Discovery with a, the other big production company within ID is Sirens Media, which kind of is based near uh, where they are in Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, her house actually has been used in uh, several episodes of uh, the things you've seen on ID, like Southern Tribe, Homicide is like the crime scene. Because these are, for the most part, these are kind of mid-level budget productions. They don't have big Hollywood sets and things like that. Because, you know, ID has a limited reach. It's not in hotels yet. I hope it will be someday, because I missed it at my hotel on the Sunday night. So uh, what I want to do is I want to pass the microphone down the line here, and I'd like to ask everyone to tell a little bit about what shows they've been in, what parts they've played, and what it's like uh, to be kind of behind the camera uh, or in front of the camera in some cases. And Gina has been both behind the camera and in front of the camera. She's also been production assistant. So Gina, tell, her, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Gina Grinkmeyer, and I uh, have, like Jim said, been on several. Uh, of the ID Channel shows, Who the Bleep, Who the Bleep Don't Marry, Southern Fried Homicide, um, a new one coming out that's not been announced yet, but I just had a lead role recently in Evil Stepmothers, so um, it was a really interesting story, where I was the old person, and that will be airing um, February 17th is the air date I got on that, so um, anyway, and our house has been used for seven of the different shows, um, Southern Fried Homicide, Who the Bleep, and so, um, what else were we supposed to say? Okay. Hi, my name is Latorsha Peters. I appeared on Investigation Discovery on the actual Homicide Hunter on the episode Blood on the Tracks. Yes. Or no, no, just just whoever's talking. Sure. I'm sorry. Whoever's talking, we'll ask them. Okay. So yes, I played on the episode Blood on the Tracks. I was the mother. And I live in Atlanta, so I do quite a few acting gigs in Atlanta. And I'm actually in law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement 17 years. I was a cop in the military for three, and now I work at the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. So I'm actually in law enforcement. I'm sorry to applaud for Gina as well. I'm Kathy Kenton, and I'm the wife. Commercial for the Memorial Day commercial with her as, as an extra number 11. <laughs> and then my other big gig was I was a barfly, which I do quite well. <laughs> and by the way, you now all will get at least one question right on the trivia the trivia contest this afternoon. You got one as a gimme, okay? I'm 
Alana Marino. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, 
obviously I, I, I thank Lieutenant Joe every day for, for my job. So, and, you know, season six means I'm employed for one more year. So that's what he's saying. And if, if it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be any single one of us standing here right now. And, and for his tireless effort and the, you know, the fantastic he job, the job that he did in Colorado Springs, keeping that, that community safe. So, I mean, I don't know if he's still in here, but I, you know, give another round of applause for mm -hmm. Lieutenant Joe. Of course, I thank his wife, Kathy, because without her forcing him to do this, uh, I wouldn't have a job right now. So I thank, thank you, Kathy, and everything you had to go through with it. Please do I can tell you that working actor is almost like an oxymoron. Yeah, I think actor. No, no, that, that, those two don't go together. I have a lot of jealous friends back in San Francisco. But then, of course, I thank my wife, and uh, she's without me every other week for, for eight, nine months out of the year and stuff, too. And, She's always there, and she's always the first one that I call when, you know, it's been a stressful day, this and that and stuff. And, and she does a very stressful job, too. She works in private equity with a bunch of very, you know, prima donna money people. So I'll be ranting to her knowing that she had, like, a horrible day, too, and she always listens to me, and so and I appreciate that and everything. And, of course, BK, who's become a good friend of mine, and uh, when I came up here on stage, I almost wanted to walk underneath this and say, hey, so, so what, what do we got? <laughs> And, and, and BK has a tough job, and it's, it's more tough nowadays than it's ever been in, in law enforcement, and they have to keep their head on the swivel. And uh, I think uh, many of you, if not most of you, know that I'm a big supporter of first responders and wounded warriors, and, and in the past two years, uh, with your, a lot of your help out here, I'll be raising almost $75,000. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Um, but anyways, uh, Joe was talking about, you know, the actors and playing dress up and everything like that too. And of course, I think you all know I came from like the traditional acting background. I was you know, born in Los Angeles. Uh, my, my parents were Academy Award winners, and, <laughs> which isn't true. I, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, uh, pretty much on a dairy farm. Uh, I was a deputy sheriff working at jail for almost my whole life. So I, I know bad people, and um, that's helped me on the show. Uh, I mean, there probably wasn't a week that went by where I wasn't in a, you know, some kind of physical altercation with somebody that didn't like me, or wanted to kill me, or threatened to kill me and my family. And so I, I really appreciate what, you know, what these people do and stuff on top of that. But um, you know, the whole acting thing is something I, I never wanted to do. I never had any desire to be an actor. Uh, I kind of have to thank my, my Aunt Jeanette, who's back here. Uh, my cousin Carl, who's he's at the art auction right now, because he decided he needed to be here to ask me questions. He just sent me text messages all the time. So, but I thank those two, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have moved out to California. And if I didn't move to California, I wouldn't have met my wife, and wouldn't have gotten to acting or whatever. And getting to acting, I kind of fell into it type thing. And I was very lucky, very, very fortunate. Um, I used to joke to my actor friends, is that, don't you just move to California and they give you your SAG card? That's kind of how it happens, right? And it doesn't happen that way. And there are a lot of actors out there that uh, have been struggling for 20 years and, you know, still working every day. I mean, I think Gina knows how, how tough it is to acting. And, and just you're always looking for the next job, always looking for, you know, promotional things. Yes, and you, you get very good at uh, letting the door close and forgetting how bad that audition was. So, and, and if they don't call you, just, well, they must have lost my contact information. So, uh, but anyways, uh, you know, getting this job was kind of a dream come true. I mean, it, and I kind of have to credit Alona for that, too. Uh, I came across the L.A. casting, and I, I read it, looked at how much it paid. And I'm like, do I want to drive all the way to L.A. to audition for this? Because, you know, a brand new show, they don't generally pay too much on the ID network. So, and then once you get there, you, you audition. If it goes well, you get a call back. And it's like, do I stay in LA? Do I drive six hours back and six hours back down? Well, you know, I don't, I don't put that kind of mileage on my car. And she's like, you know, you fit the specs good. You know, submit for it, submit for it. And so I did submit for it. I was able to, you know, do an interview over the phone first and, you know, talk to the, the casting people and producers and stuff. And, uh, needless to say, I'm very happy I did submit for it, because otherwise it'd be somebody else standing up here right now. Uh, I'm very happy that that's not the case, because it's, uh, you, know, you know, five years it's gone by like, very fast. And, and it's just amazing just seeing the support you know, you know, across the country, across the world. It's been absolutely amazing. But, uh, yeah, so I do enjoy acting now. And I still cringe a little bit when somebody asks me what I do for a living, because I remember what I used to think when people told me they were an actor, when I asked them what they did for a living. And I'd be like, oh, so where do you bartend? <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a reason why in Los Angeles, every bartender and waiter and waitress are like the best looking people you've ever seen. Because they're, they're all actors and actresses. Uh, 
so I've been very fortunate, and, and I thank all of you. I mean, you've obviously been a big reason why I've been successful. Because uh, without you, you know, I, I wouldn't be anyone. So thank you. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do very similar, uh, except. Uh, to what we just did, except there are uh, seven potential people you could ask questions of. Also, if you have any uh, technical questions about what goes on <laughs> behind the scenes, uh, it is a fairly uh, kind of tight-knit production where sometimes people have to wear different hats. So some of these people, especially Carl, have actually helped out behind the scenes as well. So any kind of question about how the show comes together or what it's like to be uh, you know, a former starving artist that now has kind of become successful and things like that. So who would like to ask the first question? Way in the back. All right, I'm getting my exercise today. Here we go. Hi, uh, my name is Nick, and this is a question for Carl. Um, I, first of all, I would imagine it would be kind of intimidating to try to fill. Can, can I just stop you real quick first? You're not going to ask me if I smoke for real, are you? <laughs> no. Okay, because I just want to get that out there. I do not smoke. So I, I figure uh, yeah. smoke and booze is all fake on that. Yeah, but, but anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, but I, I would imagine it would be it, kind of intimidating to try to fill Joe Kenda's shoes um, in this acting role. Um, but I, I was wondering, as we watch the show, and as we've heard uh, Lieutenant Joe this morning, I mean, he's, he's got a great personality and a great sense of humor. And it seems like in the scripting of the show, his personality comes out as he's relating things, but they seem to script you very straight, uh, kind of a Joe Friday, nothing but the facts man kind of thing. And I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion in the scripting about maybe slipping some of the Kenda persona, persona and uh, Kendaisms, as they're called, into your scripting. Well, we, we always say that we would like to do that a little bit more, and, and, and I so want to give a my 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 on the show. <laughs> but, but those are reserved for Joe, and those are his, and I think they come much better coming from his mouth. But it, uh, it's been an honor playing him. Um, it's, it's it's one of those things where I remember the first time I, I talked to him, I, you know, I asked him, well, how, how do you think that I do? Because honestly, I don't care what anyone else thinks as long as you approve of what I'm doing. And I tried to ask him questions about well, what, what do you think I should do different or whatever else, and he, he wouldn't tell me because he didn't want to do that. And I, I appreciate that fact that he let me take it however he thought that I thought I should go with it. And, and I try to portray him as, in a way that I think that that's how he was when he was younger. And more straight to the point, more straight, you know, especially coming onto a crime scene. Because obviously, you know, I get a lot of comments that I don't smile very much on the show. Well, it's not a very happy show. You know? And there's not a lot of moments where I can smile and, and, and you know, joke around. And, and, and it's, it's done that way for a purpose. You know, the people's families are watching the show. And, and I always, every once in a while, have to, to rein in another actor or actress on the show who wants to add like some jokes or some ad libs and things like that. And it's like, you remember, you're portraying a person that's possibly going to be watching this show. They might not appreciate the fact that you're making jokes at the expense of their deceased father, mother, brother, sister, son. So. It's, we take it very seriously, and we want to make sure that we always take it very seriously. Because you know, then you watch the show, and, and I see the interviews, which I, I don't ever see those until I watch the show either. And they're very emotional watching for me, knowing that I reenacted their child's death. So, it is. Okay, uh, another question for any of the seven people up there. Here we go. This is kind of what you were just talking about. Does the show contact the families on the different cases and? Uh, just to respect their feelings or their characterizations, do they have to get approval at all? And I'm not sure exactly what that process is. I mean, obviously, I know they do because you see a lot of the family members on the show. Jim. Jim. Okay. Uh, yes. They. The the answer to that question. I have the answer. The answer is that I always contact the families personally, and I tell them I intend to do their case. Now, in uh, in Colorado, it's open record. So I can present your case whether you like it or not. It's public record. However, I don't feel that way. And so I always ask him, we're going to do this. We present it exactly as it happens. So we're not taking license with their loved one's death. It's exactly the way it was. We eliminate some things because if I put a murder case on TV the way it went, 
The show would last for 16 weeks and nobody would watch it. It would drive you crazy. You, know, you got this rabbit warrior and oh, it's the wrong one. What about this guy? You no, know, he's in jail the night of the murder. Oh, shit. You know what I mean? So you do this all the time. So you take it to the highlights of the case. But on every occasion I've had that family say to me, we don't want our loved one to be forgotten. So that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, another question? John? I have a question for Gina. Um, you mentioned that uh, you are about ready to appear in Evil Stepmother. As a obviously very nice person, I'm sure, how tough is that kind of a transition for a role like that? You have to be evil, right? Yeah, I did a lot of yelling. And, well, actually, it wasn't hard because it <laughs> because I thought, oh great, you know, the casting crew is going to think we've got this woman from Indiana, she's not supposed to be here, she's going to be underfoot, we're on a tight schedule, what in the world are we going to do with her? And my friend uh, Karen, who's, she and her husband Doc are uh, with us on the cruise, she went with me and we got, we were late getting to the set, we just got lost, and I, it, I was really nervous, but the minute we got there, they were gracious and welcoming and made us feel like we were part of the family that we were supposed to be there. We spent the whole day with them on set and it was, it, they calmed down the nervousness and they just made it feel so casual and so it was serious that we, they were obviously doing good work, but it, there was not a moment that we felt like we were in the way or they were, that we weren't accepted. And then afterwards we got to go out to dinner with some of the cast and crew and so it was just a, it's a real positive experience and it could have, it had it been different. It could have been very disappointing, but but I, I honestly am so, I still, I look back and I think, how did this happen, you know? But somebody had to win, and hopefully next time around it'll be one of you. I want to give you some money to play in the casino for me, okay? You're so lucky. All right, next question. Yes, sir. Where are all the exterior shots for the show? Uh, Carl, could you answer that, Carl? Uh, most of them are in Colorado Springs. Uh, when you see like the overhead shots and the police department. We, we do shoot some when you see the driving scenes. I mean, that's through Knoxville, Tennessee, which every once in a while you'll may, may notice a recognizable feature of, of Knoxville, Tennessee. But uh, yeah, they, they do try to keep it pretty uh, good as far as getting city shots of Colorado Springs and when you see the police station from the outside and stuff. Next question. Yes, sir. I'm not quite sure to, to address this, too, but you say you have season six coming. How many episodes are in season six, and how many episodes are usually in a season when you do sell out? Uh, well, we started with six episodes, and that's kind of a standard thing, you know, see what's going to happen, throw it out there, see if people like it. And uh, in the first season we shot in Los Angeles, and uh, they spent a lot of money on it. And it, it got, you know, great reviews, but they didn't do that great of a job editing the show. And because of that, that's why we quit that, because it's a lot cheaper to film in the Southeast. They moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, where they do ten times the job and probably a tenth of the budget. Um, but, uh, sorry, what was the exact question? <laughs> I, I, I got a ten. Well, okay, I start off with six. We start off with six. All right, because we start off with six. Uh, when they moved to Knoxville, uh, they, they gave ten. Yeah, the next two years, there were 13 each, which is a pretty standard number for a TV show. And then last year, they went all in and said, oh, we're going to do 20 episodes, which kind of made us think, well, that's, this is probably the last season. <laughs> and, uh, and after the, you know, the reviews came out, and obviously after the premiere episode did so well, and it was, it was pretty quick after that where they said, hey, we want another 20 of those episodes. So basically the show keeps going. It's, it's based on and all of you watching it. And you keep watching, they're probably going to keep making it. Uh, I have seen, I don't know if this is newer or older, because we came into this about a, about a year ago. so. When I hit record, I did first run and review, so I will turn on my TV, I'll have 20 of them on here. 
Uh, but I've, I have noticed that some of the episodes, they're running two stories in one episode. Yes. Is that going to be the common core going forward, or will it be one episode from the album? Uh, you're, you're probably going to get a mixture of that. And, and, and there's some cases out there that they're really good cases. They just solved fairly quickly. And they kind of want to get them out there because they are really good cases. And you know, Joe did his job way too well on some of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't fill a full hour episode based on, based on that. So, so I, th I think you're probably kind of like this last season, you're a combination of one one story, two story episodes. By the way, if you pay close attention, you'll uh, this will help you on t this afternoon's trivia contest. There's some uh, some things coming out in these question and answers that will help you on the test. I have a question for Kathy Kendall. Kathy, I'm curious, when you and Joe were raising your children, what roles did each of you play? Specifically, I'm uh, curious about who was the disciplinarian. <laughs> the roles were that he went to work. He made the main money. I went to work as a nurse. I made the extra money, the fun money. I had the house, the kids, the yard. But he had the cars. I never put gas in my car. I told him that if I ran out of gas, he better come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> the discipline was handled through both of us. Uh, I handled it, and then if he came home and they were, well, dad, and he's like, uh, crap, what now? <laughs> but we, had, we both handled the discipline. We didn't have to do a whole lot of discipline with our kids. We had really, really good kids. All right. Next question. Are you on the stage? Next question. Yes. I just want to know if that's his office. Do you decorate it like his office was? I know some of the pictures and the things that are in there. Or do you just take liberty and do what you think a police officer's office should look like? I actually think I'd like to ask, uh, ask Joe to answer that because he would know whether or not it's authentic better. I have an answer and I have a funny story to go with it. But my office was very Spartan. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't wear a wedding ring at work. I didn't have pictures of my family in my office. I had a couple of oil paintings that Kathy did. She paints. And paints well enough to sell them. So, you know, it was pretty amazing. But there were one or two oil paintings and just me in that office. No name on the door, no nothing. They say on the, on the show it's the Ted Joe kind of homicide. My office was 1620. That's what it said at the door. But anyway, I also had a little narrow strip. This is not the joke, but a little narrow strip of paper that I, I, I found a computer. I got the smallest font I could find on a computer. And I put this strip across the door. And you had to get like, you had to put your nose against the door to read it. And it said, are you lonely? If you like to impress your friends, then have a meeting. Just don't have it in here. <laughs> That's what it said. Yeah, but anyway, when, uh, Kathy had never been in the building in 20 years. Never been there. I had a professional life and a personal life that didn't mix the two. They didn't know if I was married. They didn't know if I had kids. They thought maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe he's from their planet. I mean, they didn't know anything about me. I, they knew I was the boss. So my daughter goes to college, and she gets in a snit with her roommate, you know, a cat fight, you know, another girl and her, and the housing office thinks this is the worst thing since the Second World War. They call Mrs. Kenda, oh my God, these girls are fighting. Oh, not girls, you're kidding, you know what I mean? So anyway, so she has to go to Boulder to settle this business, you know, so it's a two and a half hour drive to Boulder, so she knew she would be home when I came home, so she came out of the building for the first time ever to tell me what she was up to. Because you can't get me on the phone. Just get on. You know. So she came out of the building. She walked in the front desk. They have PSRs, public service representatives. They're not policemen. They're women who wear blue sport coat, white blouse, gray skirt. You know, they probably cover you. What can I help you with? So Kathy walks in and she says, I want to speak to the town of Canada. And the woman said, do you have an appointment? She said, I need one of his wife. <laughs> It immediately goes through the building like wildfire that not only is Kent the married, but it's in the building. So everybody's going this like, is it human? What are we doing? Is, is it a girl? You know? And she's, by the time I get downstairs, because my office is upstairs, 
she's like back in a corner, you know. And I, I got her, I said, what's the matter? She said, what are they all looking at? I said, I want to see if they're human. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Everybody said, it's his wife. Oh, my God, he's got a wife. So it was really weird. That was the thing. But in the office, no, that's for the show. I went to University of Pittsburgh. That's the Pitt Banner. Uh, Kathy and I were reporting. We went to high school together, so you know, Pittsburgh is where we're from. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Where's another question? Who's the next? John has another question. Question for Carl. Just a class of, uh, clarification, Carl, of uh, <coughs> shooting in Nax uh, Knoxville and then the Colorado Springs actual scenes. The Colorado Springs actual scenes, is that like file footage and you use that whenever you need in the show, or is it updated all the time? Uh, I believe they go and they, they update it frequently. I mean, I, I know they will use some of the some same overhead shots over and over again and stuff too, but uh, you know, whenever they need something different, I'm sure they send out a team to, to film it. Yeah, helicopters are expensive. Yeah, helicopter. <laughs> yes, the helicopter with the, with the film crew. <laughs> He's drawn to recycle that a couple of times. He's drawn. Uh, or, oh, we have the lady over here. I'll get an exercise this morning. Uh, it's basically the script. I mean, Joe's already done all his, his work, and they give it to the, the people that, that write up the script and the shot list and everything else, and then, then it filters to the director producer, it comes to me, and I, I spend quite a bit of time on that. But I have, obviously, I want to study it, I want to make sure you have an idea of what's going on. Because we shoot everything out of order, so sometimes things get very confusing. When you shoot all the interrogations on one day, even though you don't even know who the actors are and what their names are yet. And so, it, uh, yeah, we definitely spend a lot of time, and I go over them with the director and the producer quite a bit, and a lot of times they will call the other producers for clarification, sometimes they, they get in touch with Joe for clarification on things too. So we want to make sure that we tell the story the right way. Everything pretty much in TV films, not so much backwards, but out of order. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? What other questions do we have? Oh, here we go. Um, from Gina and you and the Is there is there a big demand for that? Is there something about sort of the deportment of uh, someone who's been in the profession that's maybe a little bit different, so you come off as real or something? Is that? Well, I'll definitely let BK answer that because I kind of already told my story, but his is kind of fasc or, uh, fascinating also. When you say that, uh, I know from a production standpoint, they utilize us for the simple fact in real life we don't get a second take, so. They use our expertise, our knowledge, our understanding of crime scenes, of equipment, how to wear a uniform. Um, even from a time standpoint, production companies, time is money. And if you have to teach an actor how to wear a gun belt, how to draw a gun, how to cuff somebody, all of those things, it becomes very almost ineffective. And so uh, I mentioned the talent company that I work with. Lucky enough in our area, we have enough TV production going on. I think right now we have seven murder reenactment shows being shot in Knoxville you know, on any given day, uh, as well as usually two or three movie productions. There's a lot of commercial work. There's a lot of stuff. Well, with murder reenactment shows come police officers and detectives and those kind of things. So from that side of it, they utilize us. It is it's cheaper for them to, to pay us as opposed to renting all the equipment. And an actor on top of that, and then the time that it goes with it. I can follow up a little bit on that. He brings up a good point of how much I appreciate these guys on set. Uh, in season one in Los Angeles, all the police officers you see were actors. And they would show up every day, and I'd show them how to put their uniforms on. We have a scene where they had to draw their weapon. I, most of these guys have never held a weapon in their lives. And there were some very unique ways they would hold it. Which, which Last thing in the world I would want is the guys that I used to work with back in uh, Rochester, New York, calling me up. It's like, what was that guy doing behind you? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when season two happened, I found out they were using all real police officers. And it, it's just fantastic because you can just tell them, by the way, this is the scene where we're going to clear this house. They just do their jobs. And it's made everyone, everyone's life, the director, the producer, everyone on set, so much easier having these guys there. And they have, you know, any questions they have, these guys are right there to answer it. 
it's, it's, it's made my job so much easier too, just knowing I have these kind of professionals working with me. Well, that, that stands for us too, having Carl being a former law enforcement officer, he just jumps right in with us. And so we stack up on the door to go in, and we go to uh, take somebody into custody on the film. He's just one of us. And so that's always a wonderful thing there. And you ask about at what point in time does a police officer decide, hey, I want to be an actor? You know, it's funny because that really never crossed my mind, but I was the guy in high school that was in every chorus production. I was in every drama production. Uh, I've always described myself as a jock nerd. Uh, I so was, he was an actor first. <laughs> uh, you know, I was the football player that was also in the, you know, in the dramas. And so I guess that was sort of a natural progression when the opportunity arose. Deacon and I, we spent a lot of time enjoying fine cigars on set also. <laughs> There's a lot of downtime in between shots and stuff too, so we've gotten to talk quite a bit. And, uh, okay, it's, it, it's been a good friendship that's developed, uh, not only myself, but I know all of us that work on the show. There's about 10 or so officers from, from my department that we're, we're regulars on the show. You'll see us all the time. And it really is a family. You know, we, we hang out together after after the shoot. When we're, we're off duty. <laughs> We'll contact each other and go, okay, where are we having wings tonight? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. So it, it, it's a good deal. Can you tell me a little bit more about the production process? Uh, for instance, do you work on more than one show at once? Do you, do you get scripts in advance? Do you have uh, each show may have one or two rehearsals with everybody together? How, how does that process work? Well, TV, uh, particularly this type of TV, kind of goes very fast, and uh, we, you know, we get the scripts when the writers are done putting them together, and sometimes that's weeks in advance, sometimes that's when I'm on my way to the airport, and I'm waiting for a loaner to bring me the script that she printed out of work for me, and I'm sort of study down the plane. So a lot of that depends on, you know, how quick the writers are, and a lot of times a lot of turnover where we'll do two weeks in a row instead of every other week, which puts a lot of pressure on the recreation team because we don't have two teams. And normally when you do a TV show, you have an advanced team that goes out, that does pre-production and everything else, and then you have the regular production crew that takes everything that they did and makes the show. Uh, well, it, it, for Jupiter, it's obviously a you know, smaller budget, smaller type of show as far as they go. Obviously, it's, I think it's the biggest show around. But it's, uh, you know, they have a limited budget to work with, so these, the same people that do the actual production do the pre-production as well. So when they put two, Episodes together quickly like that, it does make for a lot of fast paced, quick shooting, get things done. Um, our, our director likes to make a joke in the morning when we start filming that in the, in the morning we're filming Gone with the Wind. By the time we're hitting that nine and a half hour mark, we're filming Cops. Because <laughs> you got to get it done and you got to get it in. And we don't want to go into overtime because that just opens up a whole new thing. So, yeah, it's pretty fast and furious. <coughs> Thank you. Carl, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to add that real quick. We shoot on a five-day, someday a six-day schedule. Just a quick question on the shooting. Do you use cue cards on set, or do you have someone who cues you in case you forget your lines? Or I never forget a line. <laughs> <laughs> At least not that you'll see. Are you going to tell us another story? <laughs> well, Thank you. No, and the, and the names do get kind of confusing sometimes. And uh, we had Arania, Donnie, and Alani, I think, in one episode. And, and they were all in the first few scenes, and so that became quite confusing. We, have, uh, we, we, we don't have cue cards. Uh, I've, I've been blessed with a pretty good memory as far as remembering lines and stuff. And we don't have to remember the whole script at once. It's a day-by-day, scene-by-scene thing. So you can actually practice the scene with the actual actor you're going to be in the scene with. Which, I mean, she can test with that. We actually, our scene, we went over quite a bit because it's kind of an intense scene. If you remember, I snatched the phone out of her hand and yelled at her a little bit. <laughs> she, she was doing bad things, but, uh, but we do get a chance to, to go over it several times before we start filming. Thank you. This is just a quick comment. Thank you very much, especially, officer, for humanizing the, the police in front of us. Uh, when I saw this, uh, these episodes with horrible crime scenes, and you are there, you know, sick, throwing up, it, and. Uh, Joe is the only one that's never throwing up. <laughs> I don't know how he, he does it. Well, thank you very much. I have a 13-year-old daughter, and now she, when she sees a, an officer, 
she looks at, at them in a very different way, you not know, the human beings. So, so thank you very much because this is this is something very yeah. important. Yeah, we have time for two more questions, but I just wanted to follow up on that because I had an interesting conversation with Lieutenant Joe last night about how, uh, you know, people are, are uh, we're sharing, we were talking at the hotel about how, you know, people are looking, I said, well, how's your life changed? I was like, well, I don't get a ride home from a bar with someone I just met anymore. <laughs> so when you think about all the lives that officers like Lieutenant Joe and others have saved, Thanks to true crime programs like Homicide Hunter, you think, first of all, they're saving lives because they're, it's a cautionary tale. It's like, oh, this could get you killed. Another way they save lives is that when they put, take that uh, perpetrator off the street, he can't kill any more people. And the third way they save lives is that other people see that in the news and they say, hmm, maybe I should choose another profession other than murderer. <laughs> Maybe a good idea. So even though uh, Lieutenant Joe uh, put 387 people behind bars, he has probably saved thousands and thousands of lives. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Lieutenant Joe. We have time for two more questions here and over here. I don't think you have this here today because I haven't heard about it, but. What would really be good if you do this again is bring an outtake reel. Yeah, a looper yeah. reel. We have a, uh, an entire episode. We have an entire episode for you tonight. I think I... Well, if, if we had any bloopers, we would bring them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is our final question. We actually do have one. I have a couple of announcements after this yeah, question. We have the one of me turning around here today in this game. Carl, have you ever met any of the actual criminals that Joe prosecuted and parade during the filming of the show? I have not. I, that's, I kind of don't want to, especially after seeing the horrible things that they've done. But, uh, I'm glad that the, pretty much all of them are locked up. So, no, I have not. Okay, so I have a couple of announcements. Uh, it's lunchtime! So, you have uh, several options for lunch. There's the uh, buffet up on the Deck 11 where we had the lunch yesterday. They also have a full sit-down lunch in the dining room as they do on uh, most sea days and basically it's open seating but you have to go with if you know if you can't tell people I'll just meet you there at the table they you have to go if, they, if there's like two couples that want to go together there's four of you six of you get your get your uh, group together and then go see the people to get your uh, your dance. Wonderful sit down service. And, but then uh, make sure that you are, uh, and thank you for most of you were here uh, 15 minutes early. Let's try to whatever time we tell you, uh, you know, the thing starts, let's try to be 15 minutes early so that we can actually start on time and, and maximize the short time we have together. And at 2 o'clock, please remember don't come back here at 2 o'clock. Go to the conference center where you picked up your little stickers uh, and some of you picked up your t shirts yesterday, conference room, uh, deck two forward. and at the hotel, I was telling people that not everyone was there. In this ship, if you are toward the back of the ship and you use the main elevators and you go to deck two, you can't get to the conference center unless you can walk across ice uh, and maybe trip and fall. And uh, <laughs> then they'll have to draw a chalk outline and you have to go investigate that. Kind of stuff. So, so what you have to do is come forward first before you go to deck two and then go down here at this set of elevators down to deck two, so we'll have our orientation at two o'clock, and then after that we'll have the trivia contest with lots of prizes that were provided by the Kendas and the Marinos. And, uh, and then again, uh, we'll uh, have tonight uh, the, uh, an activity which is open if you want to bring someone in that is on the ship but not in our group uh, to, uh, to come back here. And again, try to be here 15 minutes early at 6 o'clock. And it, you may want to get here even earlier than 6 if you want to get a good seat because this place will probably be packed to the rafters. It will be very exciting. We will be the first people ever on this planet uh, that weren't directly involved with the show. We will be the first audience members to see this new episode uh, called City of Fear. We'll see it a few hours before people in the United States see it. We'll see it a few weeks before people in Canada see it. We'll see it a few months before the rest of the world sees it. So it's going to be a very exciting day today. And so no let's commercial. give everyone a round of applause. Oh, wow.
Because he's a little guy, and he's got a gun. And he was having a time of his life, and that's what made him so popular. And you get so wrapped up in it. You know, there was somebody in a podcast that said, well, is it really as gory and as ugly as it is? No, it's worse. <laughs> uh, the interim scene there with me with blood all over me and my wife screaming in the kitchen, you know, and it was like a day at the office. Here's a guy. Not, not the robber. He's a guy. He decides that life is horrible and he's going to end it all and he's got a gun, you know, but he doesn't really have the nerve to do this. So at the critical second, he brings the muzzle forward. When he pulls the trigger, he flinches. He takes out his eyes. <coughs> he removes his nose. Now he's blind and he's in agony and his face is gone and he's trying to pick up the gun to finish it. Now he's ready to finish it, okay? So we have to get that away from him and, uh, God, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to go back to work now. Sorry, <laughs> we're going to call you to a hospital. I got to go change clothes, you know. That's just how it was. You get to the point where sometimes it's so insane, you really don't think it's insane. You know, it's like, well, that's just a normal day. I mean, what the hell, you know? Uh, that guy looked, uh, boy, that guy looked bad, you know, and he certainly did that. You know, but you see so much of it that you don't react to it. You know, the only thing I was was annoyed he was taking me away from something I was doing. Now I'm going to drive all the way across town and change clothes. You know, you son of a bitch, why didn't you just kill yourself? That's what you're to do. You're such an incompetent fool, you can't even kill yourself. Which he couldn't do. But, you know, it's really kind of nuts, you know, but... So these cases, I've said before, they go on and on, right? They, they take a lot longer than, well, we do some of these take a lot longer than we demonstrate. You just you don't sleep, you don't go home, you don't do anything. You're trying to find a ghost. Who is this guy? We don't know. He's a little guy, you know? A small. That narrows it down to what, half the population? I mean, you know, so, and then you got everybody yelling at you, and it's, it's just, it's part of the, it's the nature of it. It's the nature of it. And, and there are cops in here, or retired cops, who know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you just know, if, you do, if you're not a cop, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you are, you certainly do. Because you're everybody's enemy. At, during some of those moments, you're everybody's enemy. Nobody likes you, they all hate you. And you just have to accept that. And you, uh, don't let it get to you because you got work to do. You can't be concerned about what people think of you. Let them think whatever they like. Let them think whatever they like. So this particular case was different because it was an opportunity to interrupt a criminal act that without a doubt would have resulted in death. He shot that guy in the back uh, because he wanted to kill him. He didn't kill him. The guy was lucky. He didn't die. But it's not because of Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown's intent was to cause his death. You have to look at the perpetrator's intent. He doesn't shoot him enough. Okay? He doesn't shoot him in the right place. And he survives. But it's not because he wanted him to. He expected that guy to die. He just didn't. So that's part of it, too. You, you see these things happen all the time, and you are the guy, you are the guy that everybody turns around and looks at. So what are we going to do now? <laughs> what, you think I know? I, I don't know what we're going to do now. We're, we're going to, uh, I don't know, let's panic. That seems like a good plan. You, know? uh, you just, you really, you get you're lost in it, and you get lost in the moment of it. And you have to just keep plugging away. And don't get panicky and don't get upset and that's okay, let's think about this. I tried the voice identification because what else are you going to do? He's wearing a mask. 
Maybe you recognize his voice, you know what I mean? Maybe some, anything, anything. But it's not uncommon for armed robbers to drop things when they hear the police coming. Because if you're found, well, I don't have a gun. I don't have a mask. I don't have gloves. I don't have nothing. You're just messing with me because I'm out here. Yeah, police, you're messing with me. Yeah, okay, well, okay, you're right, we are, you know. <laughs> so you, you dispose of it. You drop it, you put it, you hide it, and you walk down the street with your hands in your pockets. You're not running, because we have nothing on him that connects him. If we find him, we'd have to release him. He's got no evidence in his person. So what do you do about that? Nothing, you know, nothing. And a guys that in that business, the guys that commit that crime all the time, they're well aware of that. So you have that factor happening as well. And that makes it even more difficult sometimes to pursue someone you cannot identify, no, no one can identify, uh, but here we are, and he is busy, busy, busy. He's not gonna stop. He needs the money to feed a drug habit. The guy that had that gun, uh, it was really funny. The interrogation lasted a lot longer than it shows in the show, but he was so determined to just blow us off and how dare you keep me here and so on and so forth. And when I showed him that form, I, I turned it and I said, read that. That's you, isn't it? You see that? Now when you saw it, it was yellow, because in those days they were yellow. It's a 4473 firearms transaction record. This one's white because it's a copy. When you see question number five, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And you said no. Wrong answer, Holmes. <laughs> that's the wrong answer. And I got a Fed out here in the hallway that's gonna just have you for lunch. You know what I mean? So why don't you sit there and look at that form for a little while and you think about how loyal you are to this piece of shit you gave that gun to. And I walked up. And I watched him, you know, through the mirror. And he's, he's like, all of it, he's like freaked. You know, and he's looking at this, he keeps looking at the paper, he keeps looking at it, he looks at it, he looks at it, he looks at it, he looks at the signature, <laughs> you know. And you can just see it happening. The wheels are going crazy, like, oh, shit, you know, I didn't know they had this, you know. And then it's really funny, you know, then you go back and so, uh, so what do you think? You know, huh? you want to just go to jail? You love this guy, I'm sure he'll come visit you, won't he come visit you? <laughs> this might go wrong, this might go wrong. Yeah. The only way to get information from a non-cooperative business is pressure. Pressure is the only thing people understand. I was affected because I would say to people, you're going to tell me what I want to know. And if you don't, I am going to destroy you. I am absolutely ruthless, and you're about to meet that part of me. So if you're a witness that you're protecting your buddy, you better think about it. How good of a friend is he? Because you're gonna suffer like you've never suffered. And it's the same with that guy, same with that guy. So we got about 15 more minutes, and we're gonna clear this room. So in 15 minutes, we can do that. Anybody have any questions about this? Yes, ma'am. He got hammered flat like they always do. I mean, you know, they, you, there is no mercy. Mercy's in the movies, okay? Well, I'm, I was cooperative. Yes, you were. We appreciate that very much. Well, what's that going to mean to me? Nothing is what it's going to mean to you. you know? You're under arrest. What? Well, you're under arrest. It's that part about you admitting to a crime. See, that's a problem. It, it, it's just a problem. You know? And we're not going to forgive you, and we're not going to forget this. He got 15 years for driving the car. A little less than he would have otherwise, but he did finally tell us. So he got 15 years. That's a long time on the inside. Anybody else? When you went home to change clothes, yeah. did your wife ask you after she got up off the floor, next time call me? No, she knew better. I never would do that. I never would. I never would. And it's just, I, I didn't, I never thought about it. I just, you know, I threw a lot of clothes in a trash can, you know. <laughs> Easier because I thought they were full of cockroaches or they had body fluid or something, you know, so. 
I walked in the house one night naked, with a patch case and a gun. You know, all the clothes are in a trash can. She says, ah, right then, you must have had a great, oh, it was wonderful today. Um, yeah, you just, you, you wind up and say, hey, 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 bless you, you don't want to be, have those same clothes again ever. You take it to the drag cleaners, they just point at the door, get out. So that's, that's the origin of the cheap suit. Because they're disposable, you throw them away. I had a friend of mine at, at May DNF, which was a, no longer a business, but they were a company that sold men's clothing. And he worked in men's clothing. He's my buddy. And when they would change over from the seasons, when the wool suits were not being sold because now it's spring and summer, and they got the lightweight suits, well, now he'll sell those winter suits for spit, okay? So he'd, I'd go buy 10 suits, 100 bucks a piece, that are four or $500 suits, nice suits, you know? Shirts, ties, I'd show up, I'd give them money, we'd carry out this pile of stuff, and a year later I'd be back because I need more. Because I threw them away, I ruined them, whatever. A gun always rips the lining out of a coat, you know, because it grabs it, the line, they're lined with like silk or something like that. And the grip on the weapon will pull, just tear it up, shred it, you know. So my wife started sewing uh, elbow patches that you buy to put on sweaters. She'd sew an elbow patch inside the coat, so the gun would rub against the elbow patch, and it would last a little bit longer. Uh, you know, it, it's like a, so. I took them to Goodwill one time. They were they were not soiled by human stuff, you know. So they, I took them to Goodwill, and the guy says, "Why is that shoulder patch in that jacket?" Well, I said, it's a long story, but anyway, here you go. You know, like, oh, okay, okay. I never saw that before. No, you probably never did. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you, you know about the, the ladies that serve from over here? Where's over here? <laughs> oh, right there in front of me, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the lady who does the journalist piece, the newspaper. How were you able to get them? Did they, did they actually... I, Ann Irvin and I are friends. Did they actually par partake in your cases? No, they were they were working on the on the press. There's, there's uh, Ann Irvin, Sandra Mann, a couple other ones as well. I developed a relationship with those members of the press because they were actually journalists. They were respectable. They did a fine job. If you told them not to say it, they wouldn't. They would only report the truth. And if I said to them, you can't tell anybody, okay, and they wouldn't. So Ann Irvin and Sandra Mann and a couple of other people always got the exclusives. And nobody else could understand that. Well, how'd they get that? Because they're like nice people and you're not. <laughs> I, had a, uh, I had a reporter, uh, Ann Irwin, working at Channel 11 with some of the local TV stations. When we, uh, we had a, a murder case, an ugly case. They're all ugly, but anyway. I called her up and I said, hey, you do me a favor. Sure, what? I said, I want you to make this, what I'm going to tell you, the lead story tonight on the news. Why is that? Well, I, as, uh, I'll explain one of these days, but not today. But anyway, could you do a list? Well, oh, sure. I said, I just arrested a woman for first-degree murder in this case. A woman? She said, you wouldn't have to tell me to make that first. Well, I'm asking you to do that because there's somebody else I'm going to arrest and I want to rattle his cage, which is her boyfriend. <laughs> so she said, okay. So, yeah. Lead story, 30 seconds. The boyfriend's uncle is on the phone. Why didn't you tell us about an arrest in this case? I said, we'll be in touch with you and your nephew as the evening wears on. <laughs> Silence on the phone. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know we arrested him for murder, too. So they, they had their uses, but they're nice people, those particular people. Okay, I like that. Anybody else? Over there. All the way over there. This time I saw you. <laughs> I wondered whatever happened to the gentleman who tried to take his own life. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no interest or concern with people who want to kill themselves. Living is hard. Dying is easy. You want to be dead? Go be dead. Don't do it in here. We're going to buy carpet. <laughs> it's good for the lawn. Okay? That is, it's good for it. I mean, it'll bring it back nice and green in the springtime. I could care less. You want to die? Go die. All right? 
You want to live? Okay, we'll talk about you living. But oh no, people who surrender, see ya. Okay? So I have no idea. He's probably dead, I presume. I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah, I get you running. While we're waiting, we need to give uh, Jim here, and he's done a great job with this. Yeah. It's not easy, you know. It's not easy to be a large group of people, particularly when there's alcohol involved. You know? <laughs> you get him to show up in one place at the correct time, but he's ain't been able to do that. Yes, ma'am. I don't really have a question, but I do have a comment. I worked for King Supers in Colorado Springs for 28 years. Mm -hmm. I worked at Uanta Gardens King Supers yeah. when that shooting happened. Oh, yeah. And um, know Paul Fister and Tony Trahill very well. They're nice people. And we were so thankful that you wrapped that up quickly. <laughs> oh, I know. Everybody was. And we even got a... Uh, we had a wonderful chocolate cake from the bakery department. <laughs> Ooh, look at this. Oh, and it was huge. I mean, everybody had a piece of chocolate cake. Well, I didn't know that, but hey, I'm glad you, uh, we one, were able to one, save one it. One question, though. Sure. Why on, on, this, on these latest episodes, sometimes you don't say the year or what the location was that it happened. In yeah, Congress and Springs. I don't know why that's true because I do when they interview me. That's a choice made during the post-production, which I really don't have much to do with. I do have control over it in the sense that I control what's being done or said in these shows. As to the minute details of it, I don't pay attention to it. I just want to make sure that what is being said is true and accurate and correct to the case. But as to the other stuff, I kind of don't pay attention. They almost always do that, <clears throat> but they didn't do it on this one. And they've done a one other one they didn't do it either. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea. The honest answer, I don't know. Anybody else? <clears throat> we'll get you next. We're still got about 10 minutes, so. I'm curious, which years are these cases pulled from? What years were you active as? 70s, 80s, and 90s. 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, I think two and a half decades. Uh, and uh, Larry Martin, who's sitting right here tonight. Uh, Let's give a round of applause to Larry Martin, who's also been to the show. Please stand up, Officer Larry Martin. Larry and I spent a lot of sleepless nights together to where we really got tired of each other's company, particularly at five o'clock in the morning or when everybody's on the nod, you know. And so, so Larry knows all about this stuff and it was involved in almost all of this. And uh, we, uh, we worked together for forever. And now we do again. Now we still do. Right, so right, good, good for us. You know. Who else? My question's a quick one. Sure. In the opening, you're shown as left-handed. I am. In fact, left-handed. I am left-handed. Woo! Yes, my wife's left-handed. My kids are right-handed. Who knew? I mean, you know. I mean. But yeah, they, we are both left-handed. Hello, Diane. Hey, Joe. Have other crew members appeared in some of the episodes other than Jeff? What? Yes. Yeah, they have. They have. There's been a couple of them. Okay, yeah, so right next to, right next to, to Jeff was one of the assistant camera guys, and you know, I, you know, they, they do that sometimes just for laughs, it's like, uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock used to like to be in his own movies, he was always in a store buying something, you know, that's kind of the same thing, you know, I'm surprised that Jeff had a line in this, though, but I think that's funny, I'll have to rag him about it. I know, I know, yeah, I know, uh, it's weird, you know. He's a good guy. He's a real good guy. They do a really, really good job, I think. Who else? Still got a couple of minutes. There's usually a case that bothers you that you haven't been able to solve. You want to talk a little bit about that? Which one? <laughs> uh, it, uh, legally in Colorado, 
in, in, in legally in Colorado, an unsolved homicide, there is no statute of limitations for the crime of murder. Okay? So the contents of a case investigation of an unsolved homicide are restricted by law to officers of the court, which would include the police, the prosecutors, the defense bar, uh, and that's all. They are not privy to the press, they're not privy to anything. So I, li I literally cannot discuss that because it would be a crime if I did. Uh, they are contained within that file, considered to be active criminal investigations. They are still pursued by cold case units, but ultimately we can't, I can't talk about it. I, I've had many sleepless nights over it. I still do. You never get over this. You don't. It's a price you pay for the work. Was it worth it? Yeah, it was. You bet it was. But yeah, you still think, I think about it all the time. I do. I think we have time for two more questions. In the uh, episode you said about the small guys and guns, one self-defense. So do you know the most crimes that you use involve guns have been smaller people? Like, is that no. more people tend to no. like use no. guns because they're, they're like a fair guy? No, a guy, it depends on the event. I mean, I've had guys use a Louisville Slugger and, you know, a crystal ashtray and, you know, it doesn't have to be a gun. Body size doesn't, doesn't dictate what kind of weapon they use. I mean, in his case, it was about his emotion. And gun is what he could get because his buddy had one. Um, the case I talked about earlier, that family, I was invited to the family reunion. I have another family uh, that I helped, and I just went to the granddaughter's first birthday party. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you've kept close to any victims that you've helped. I, I have to some degree, but it's not a healthy thing to do. Okay, I had a detective who worked for me who, when he retired, was always talking to these victims' families. And I said, you know, you got to stop crawling around in a graveyard. It's not good for it. Okay? It's not good for it. We did everything we could do. We resolved the case. It's closed. I talk to families now when we do the show. Their reaction to me 20 years on is the same because they see me and it all comes rushing back. So, oh yeah, it does. And everybody's crying and everybody's horrible. Crying. Because it, it brings it all back to them, but it also gives them a little bit of closure. Uh, it does, they, they prefer that it's on TV because they can remember, their loved ones can be remembered. They don't want to be forgotten. Who else? Oh, the last one over here. I just wonder if, when they you the cold cases that you worked mm -hmm. and are still active, yep. do they ever call you back in on them? They they don't call me back in, they do call me. Mm -hmm. They ask me, you know, what do you think about that guy that's was interviewed here or something? That still happens. That still happens. But I don't physically go back because now I live in Virginia. I mean I'm in Colorado filming all the time, but I don't actually physically go back to the police department. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, how did you enjoy this evening? Okay, it's not nice to keep the captain waiting, and the captain is waiting out for us uh, with a glass of free champagne for you. So have a lovely evening.